much. How lovely to see you all. First and foremost, year of 2016 is the year of the monkey. So I shall be a monkey and wish you all a very happy year of the monkey. Clever wisdom, posterity, good health, success with good fortune, lucky all year and always to all of you. Happy Chinese New Year. Gong hei fa choi. Gong zhok ni de san zhong li kin. Sam sang si sing. Long ma jing san hong zhong hei li. Yao sang sam mo. Fu gui ka chang. Ka chang yi. Fu sao hong ning. Chu yap ping on chang meang fu gui. Gong zhok ni de man sao sing yi. Gong hei. I'm supposed to speak in Chinese, in Mandarin, and Cantonese, but I can speak better Toisan, that as the old Chinese used to say, the old local Chinese, Hoi San Wa, Xin Wei Wa, Yin Ping Wa, Pun Yu, Mama Fu Fu. But many years ago in Vancouver, there was very few people that speak Mandarin because they all came from Southland China, which is speaking in their own dialect, which Guangzhouwa was only when the Hong Kong people came over, then they switched to Guangzhouwa. So today, with the Far East from China, from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, such as Singapore, Indonesia, and so forth, that it's a mixture. So when they came, then we think, oh God, we got to speak Guangyu or Putonghua Mandarin. So what do we do? We're local born. I'm third generation born and raised here. My grandfather, 1881, was the pioneer in Victoria, was the first merchant that produced the sheets and the, the uh, towels and uh, linens for the Hudson's Bay department store and for the Eaton's, which as before was Spencer department store. So we talk, uh, basically, is in Chinese is our own dialect, which could be Yinping or Hoi Sanwa, but if we have to speak to Mandarin, we would have to change our English, then we switch to Cantonese, then we switch to Mandarin before it comes out Putonghua or Guoyu, which my Guoyu is Mama Fu Fu. So if you excuse me, if I speak Guangdong Putonghua, Guangdong Putonghua, so please apologize, please forgive me. Sorry, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Now, I'm supposed to be here to tell you about a little bit about what life was as it happened in real estate market then and today. Oh, today is a very jungle out there and it's so sad. But your interest today is only the highest on five years was like maybe 2.94%, which Michael Tui Thank you, Michael, for sponsoring us. And thank you, oh my, I got to stop here. First and foremost, Dixon Chang, where are you? Come up here, please. I'm here, I'm here. I want to all for you to give a hand for Dixon, unexpectedly, quietly, and form this group to be here. And he is the most hardworking, a very genuine, and for helping contribute, give back to the society, efforts just have done, raise funds for the Napio earthquake, now for the Vancouver General Hospital, is his greatness, and he put this on so that we can get together and have some fun together. Well, let's give a big hand for a great gentleman, Dixon Tang! Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
And she is great because uh, she is the owner of our Chinese, not only Chinese, right? Well, all community. Pretty well, try to. We she reached them. Quite a lot of uh, charity, and also that is uh, our pioneer in this industry. So I hope every one of you, lot, no matter you are realtor or not, you just got to learn something from her experience, right? Well, you got to share with us. It's, if you want to hear stories, okay. it's a long, long story. Just give us a first stage. Yeah, How can I'll you just join this industry. How can you develop? Okay. 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 You want me to say? Ah, one foot so long, I didn't say it. But a little bit, I'll say it. How can you join this industry? I was the youngest realtor broker in Canada long time ago. I'm the first one that uh, initiated. I had my picture. And my husband Dean Leong picture on our business card, and in all our advertisement and stationery. That was 1955. So everybody copy ever since. So now you turn around, you look at every business card. They have the picture, and I think, gee, that was back then. However, how did I get into it? Life was tough. Life in Vancouver, British Columbia, and in Canada for the Chinese was very difficult. There is no way that we could have our chosen professions or to do what we want to do or employment. When I graduated from the Vancouver College in Accounting with Mary Lee, who is now, was, maybe she just finished, the First Lady of Alberta. Mary Lee, being a fa prominent family of the Lee Bigs and Bob Lee's sister, didn't need a job, but I did. I had to go and find a job, but when we graduated, Mr. Moore says to me, well, ladies, you're Chinese. We're not going to get you any job because multiple na national company stated very clearly, no Oriental, no East Indian employment. We could not work at any places that we want or apply, even they want to hire us. Their constitution is hire no Oriental, which is Chinese, and East Indian. So I went to the Hudson's Bay in 1953 or 55. I sent to Ms. went right up to Mr. Ernie Brown. I said, Mr. Ernie Brown, you're the general manager. You're not going to hire me because I'm Chinese. Your constitution is not going to hire me. He called the personnel manager in. And the personnel manager concurred, yes, our Hudson's Bay Company department store and all the national company of Canada does not hire Chinese or East Indian. Mr. Brown was very kind. And I said to him, I can read and write Chinese. I can speak several dialects of Chinese. I can translate and I can interpret for you to help the sales at the bay. He considered, OK, I'll give you two weeks trial. You do three jobs for the price of one. $100, six days a week, 7 to 6 PM. I read all the cash register in the, in the main floor. I do the bookkeeping machine of under the B. I do all the translation and sales credits for the bay on bay day. So I got $100 a month was a big deal. Gosh, it was good to earn $100 at the national company at the Hudson's Bay department store. Now, that slowly opened the door of the department store hiring Chinese and East Indian. Then. Woodward's department store was the largest pharmaceutical and food floor in Western Canada. Same goes, no Oriental or East Indian. But everybody wants to work for Woodward's. There's Mr. Sat Singh there, who is in the master of the mechanic department at Woodward's department store. Hey, Sid. <laughs> and so therefore, my sister, a graduate in gold medal in pharmaceutical, and in biology. We went to the pharmaceutical department, Mr. Davis. You're not going to hire us, your constitution. 
Well, Gwen can do a lot for you and look after your prescription in both Chinese and English and blah, blah, blah. He went up to the board of director to change the constitution to hire her and we opened the door at Woodward at your department store and therefore thereafter there is a lot of good Chinese employee. Then, look at our politics today. It's run by multi-culture. We have East Indian cabinet minister running the country. We have Italians and French, well of course the Italian always was. There's John B, our leader of our leader of the Italian society, John Bavaria. John, you're a great man for the Italian. He built the Italian city center. He did the Pacific National Exhibition p and &E, Italian Garden, but the best part of all, he's 35 year at the income tax, a senior officer. So if you want to know anything about income tax, ask John. However, what, after all that difficulty of getting employment, that's how we got, I got into real estate. We thought it's better to go and do your own business, it's better to then to try to get a good job. The old Chinese saying, Gan ji ga ngau, ho go, ba ba, wo ji ge zhou, ge gai zai, chik 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 lai zhou, ho go gan ji ga mao, ngau man pei. So my husband, Dean Liang, was in, went in, he's a professor, he's an uh, old scholar of the classical Chinese literature poet, and he was a, a teacher. But to get a job here was impossible. So together, we start our own business. He in life insurance, I'm in real estate. Real estate, you have to be licensed, and life insurance and general insurance, you also have to be licensed. So we both had, you cannot be life insurance and real estate at the same time. You cannot be real estate and be insurance at the same time. So therefore, we split. He in life insurance, I'm in real estate. And in real estate at that time, not like you folks here now, in the interest at 4%, my father-in-law was yelling bloody smith. He says, CMH, CMHC is gonna charge me 4% for me to buy a house? Oh God, the house then was average, not even the price of a down payment. To own a house was really the assets of your life. It's important, home sweet home, and your home is your cash flow. Your castle is that you make every effort to own your own home. And that's how we had helped the Chinese community to able to buy their own home because we Chinese was discriminated by the lawful government. We cannot live anywhere. We cannot go near British property. We cannot go to Sonnesee. We cannot live where we want. They will not let you buy, it's on the title, register in the BC Land Act, no Oriental East Indian, including Je uh, Jewish. Where? The Chinese Cultural Center land, right in Chinatown. The title register, no Chinese, Oriental, East Indian, and Jews. So. Dave Barrett, the former premier of British Columbia, never ceased to remind me. He said to me once at a head table, we were together with the Honorable Gordon Downing, uh, how, former House Speaker and MOA. He said to me, Faye, do you know who started the Chinese Cultural Center? I said, of course I know. The Chinese Cultural Center, my husband named it and you helped it. I said, Man Fa Zhong Sam, my husband Liang Chun Gong, Tong Gok Wei, Gody, Gody Kiu Ling, Tong Me, Gody Tong So, Nidi Mo Da Ga La, Man Fa Zhong Sam, Zhou Hai Gong Sai Ga Ming La. The Chinese cultural name speaks for itself. All you associations of 20 gathering here fighting, no need to fight. And on top of that, 
the land is restricted. So Dave Barrett in, says to me, here's Alec McDonald, the attorney general sitting next to you. A Alec McDonald, you tell Faye and tell her to tell Jenny Kwan to get on the soapbox and tell everybody that the cultural center land was restricted, that I became premier on the second week in 1972. Advise you, Alec McDonald, to remove that restriction and sold it for one dollar to the cultural center to able to build the cultural center. So, we had gone through such difficulties, such hardship, such suffering of the lawful discrimination, we cannot lease, rent, buy, do in other parts of the city other than living in Chinatown. So Chinatown sounds better than a ghetto. So we all live right around Chinatown, Strathcona, and thereabout. So this is why they cannot buy homes elsewhere at that time. After the Second World War, during the Second World War, the Canadians, the Canada government, was getting short of a Canadian Caucasian men to go to war. So they got to come down to Chinatown. They got to come down to Chinatown to hire our Chinese, to draft, I shouldn't say hire, to draft our Chinese boy to war. Our Chinese boy, all are Canadian born, but on their birth certificate, like Duck Zhang, the first Chinese MP and the war veterans, birth certificate is Chinese national only, not Canadian born certificate. Chinese national only, subject to deportation. And yet, you're asking us to go to war, we're not recognized as Canadian. But patriotically, like Julia, this beautiful lady here, her godfather, Herbie Lim, is one of the old veterans. They're all good friends, and they went to war f f f to fight for Canada freedom, in spite of not being recognized as Canadian. I was, we were very, excuse me, we were very thankful that the war ended as it did in August 1945. If it had waited another year, no, another week, all the boys would not come marching home because they were very short time of training to send to the Pacific Theater to go behind the Japanese enemy line. So when they came home and we all fought together, the Chinese community and the veterans, in May the 12th, 1947, we won the enfranchisement. The enfranchisement that we were allowed then to be recognized as Canadian. We can vote, we can choose our professions, we can rent, and we can live anywhere. So that's when, in, when I was started in real estate, was the purpose to help every Chinese I can possibly can to buy their own home. I did the financing, I did the mortgages, I even went to Cranbrook, I fly to Cranbrook for this Chinese who has a family like to come in back to Vancouver to educate the children in the Chinese school as well as the Canadian school so that they can become, choose their profession. So there was no way for him to do, able to come with his asset. I flew to Cranbrook, I did the financing with the bank in Cranbrook, sorted out his assets, mortgaged the facility here in Vancouver so he was able to buy a rooming house and raise their family and educate the family. Today, I'm proud to tell you they never cease to thank me. Are all graduated engineer, teachers, and respectable citizen giving back to the society. So that's one of the examples in real estate. You have to do 
not just people say, oh, you're just going to show them a house. You're going to open house. You're just going to look at the property. Uh Uh-uh. You do services. You do work, whether you're in insurance, in real estate, or in whatever sales. You have to do a lot of services for your clientele. I train a lot of salespersons. They're in Chinatown. Jack Chow, he couldn't even speak Chinese. We took a tape recorder, my husband and I teach him. He was my, I trained him in real estate insurance. When he was ready to open his own office in China, and he stole all my file and took it to him for his insurance business. But my faithful clientele came back and told me, Nana, today I am very happy and very honored that all those people still say they're patronizing me. It isn't. My, I, my business in real estate, insurance, both general insurance, real estate, and, and all that, was give as well as property management, mortgages, financing, development, building. All that was part of my business. So we built a lot of homes for our Chinese people to enjoy in a better home, and that's in Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge was generally mostly Jewish congregated district. And in East Hastings is mostly Italian. But I was very happy that I was able to build homes for everybody in those area to diversify the, the, the household neighborhood. Gary Lee is sitting in front of me and his parents and aunts and uncles homes on First Avenue and Garden Drive was those homes I've built. In Oak Ridge, when you build a home, you could have 10 same home inside interior. Interior, I have built the homes and designed it for, especially the kitchen, suitable to the family. You probably haven't seen a home with rice bin in the kitchen. In those days, it was flour bin because everybody baked. But those are the feature inside is the same, but outside is not the same. Outside, it could be cathedral entrance. It's the same house inside, but it's cathedral or it is uh, co- colonial and so forth. So therefore, I'm very pleased to tell you, to do real estate at that time is the same as now that you are giving the service. But your commission is well earned. Our commission at that time, selling a piece of property, Maybe a $16,000 full price was a lot of money. Or average, $10,000. $500 down, $2,000 down. Wow, that was a lot of money. But it was possible. So in Oak Ridge, from 41st Avenue to 63, we built those homes, especially for our Whoa, not just our Chinese, for everybody. Then Simon Fraser Gardens on Piper and, and Piper and Government. Sorry, We built 14 acres of raw land. They were all raw land at that time. Not like the developer today. We had to put in the underground sewer, underground wiring, BC Hydro, telephone wire, all had to be underground. We have to put in all the roads and everything. So it's service, service as well as sales or custom built. So I built my home on 45th and Framlin, which is one block from my Oak, and I put in as a, as a demo home of custom built. This is walnut paneling. This is rosewood. So that the family that wants home will see what kind of material we put in. Good, solid. Oh. Look, none of this prefab things, and look at this cement building that's going up. The future, I worry. Dixon asked me, what is your thoughts about the future? Look at these pre-cast cement, it's so thin. You can hear, you can hear each other walk upstairs and downstairs. And these homes are on press board building. And now they're building six-story wooden apartment condo. God, if you're gonna smoke a, have a cigarette in your bedroom, you're gonna put a fire and the whole building's gone. Like they're going now in commercial drive and so forth, losing the whole building. So my worry is that you have to tell the developer and the city that they better make sure the building code is in the 
better condition. So my son says to me, why are you worrying about these Prescott homes that is ready to be falling apart in a few years instead of building them for 50 years? They're built to, to, to be torn down. These condo are built to leak, like my building. Why am I late today? Because two elevators are broken, and it's only a 28-year-old building. So when you're selling, whatever you're selling product, whether you're selling real estate, home, insurance, health product, you will have to tell that this is what they have today is their home. Are you prepared to have this type of construction, which is part of the sales product? What is it? So ladies and gentlemen, it's very long story how we have built in those homes in real estate. Now, in real estate at that time, 1960, 1959, Chinatown is being bulldozed. Expropriated the as well as the home for the freeway to come through Chinatown down to Georgia and Granville and join the upper level. Elvin C., who this is beautiful on his Valentine video, his building, his father, the Union Laundry on Union Street were expropriated and turned down. Where I live when we were kids at 320 East Pender on Gore Avenue, my mother and father was the founder of the Bangji Chinese Public School. Bangji, Bangji, Chinese Public School. My father and my father were the founder of the Bangji Chinese Public School. My father and my father When my mother is a second generation born and raised here, Dai San Doi, I need a Chusang, Chusang the Jiong Dai, cannot go to the English school. So her English is illicit. Why? Because she's Chinese. Chinese cannot go into the English school system because we are Chinese. We are Chinese. We are Chinese. So they have the Chinese school for our children to learn Chinese. So that's why Chinese was my mother's first language because she cannot allow to go to English school to learn English. Uh, so that so Chinatown, those were all photos in the 60s, early 60s, to build the freeway. I and my husband Dean, we fought for the Chinese president, for the Chinese association. You are cutting the heart of Chinatown and the heart of downtown. Where? Georgia and Granville, across the street from the bay, is Block 61. That was going to cut through Chinatown to Georgia Viaduct, through Georgia and Granville, and join the upper level. The heart is gone. Los Angeles has no heart. It's just freeway in and out of Los Angeles. San Francisco has a heart because it's beautifully preserved. What about Vancouver? Save Chinatown. Save Georgia and Granville. Georgia and Granville also was expropriated. New York fur, Cunningham drug, Ingodu shoes, Miller's jewelry were all torn down, ready for the freeway. But we fought. I can remember standing at City Hall before the council at that time was Mayor Bill Rathie, Adelford Helford Wilson, Adam and Bill Street and Adam and so forth. You save Chinatown, you save Granville, change the vote. We won in 1963 of Chinatown because they want to build the social housing where my parents built a school was at 320 East Pender, which is at the Gore and Pender Street, to social housing. That's McLean housing, which is there now. And they want to build the Skeena housing and the Raymer housing, which we did. 
because I then became the chairman committee of the Vancouver City Mayor's Consultative Committee to help these housing. Established with the BC housing, the Chinese who has their own home in Chinatown does not want to go into the social housing, save their house. Half the federal government finally, for the first time in Chinese history, give a grant to help them renovate their homes and bring it up to date to save Chinatown Strathcona homes. In the meantime, Bento Center, the famous downtown Bento Center, Bento 1, 2, 3, and 4, the founder, Charlie's Bento. His son, Clark and Robert Bento, are very wonderful. They supported me and says, all right, we will produce a townhouse oriental style for a Chinese family who likes to live in Chinatown because they're like a turtle. When they want excitement, they come out of the shell and have all the activity, shopping, and glory of Chinatown, the character, the, en the energy. But if they want privacy, they go back into the shell and has their privacy. So let's build townhouses for the Chinatown Strathcona area. When we went the, had the plan ready, was done by uh, Replaca of Lloyd, ex, uh, Lloyd um, uh, who built all those lovely homes by Art Moody. City Hall found we do not have strata title. We cannot have townhouses because the houses at that time had to have front yard 25 foot setback. Backyard, 35 foot setback. Both side yard, five feet setback. So that means no attached home, no townhouses, no strata title. So that was uh, for five blocks by Strathcona School. Jackson, the Navy, Kiefer, Pender. We, I, with Mayor Rathy, Alderman Helford Wilson, Alderman Bill Street, apply Victoria Provincial Government. Please, let us legislate, legislate a strata title. Have a strata title act. We fought and we won. We got the strata title act in 1967. It started in 1963, November the 22nd, when we came out of the city hall and got into the car, that was when the President John F. Kennedy was killed. I always remember that date. And that made us fought to go to Victoria and fight for strata title. So strata title, I'm proud to tell you, I am the one that caused it, that you are enjoying the title. And Bob Rennie ran with it. And he never ceased to thank me. And he had announced in the radio with Ralph Mayer show that don't think anybody else is pioneer in real estate. Fei Leong is. And not a day goes by that I don't thank her for my career. Thank you, Bob Rennie. And when I moved to show his appreciation, he sent a truck and a $1,000 to help move me from my home to apartment. So, but that didn't end there for Bob Rennie. I introduced pre-sale, first time in Canada in 1967. And Bob Rennie ran with it. He asked me to speak to his real estate group at that time. And now he, Bob Rennie today is condo king. And all of you realtor is able to sell strata title. But that's how it started. That was started in the 60s, fighting for the rights, fighting for the strata title act, fighting for pre-sale. That never happened in Canada prior to that. Then, on the immigration part, and I'm sure a lot of you are immigrant here. Well, I'm proud to tell you, I'm third generation born and raised here. I'm not involved in immigration. I don't make a cent in immigration. But patriotically, I stand up. I want to make sure our Chinese people from around the world able to come to Canada without the restrictions and discrimination we had. In 1923, the Exclusion Act, no Chinese are allowed to come to Canada at all. In no, thank you, I'm fine. 
1923, only person, a few of them were allowed to come, is academic, the scholar, to teach in the Chinese school. Like Victoria Wakyu Ha Hao, Victoria Wakyu Ha Hao, a Chinese public school that my father was one of the teachers, my grandfather had helped build so that they can educate our, sec, our first and second generation Chinese that couldn't go to English school. But do you know, not, you all know about the $500 uh, head tax, but you don't know, including the government, which I've said that at their uh, consultant committee when they were asking about BC government wrongdoing to the Chinese pioneers, that they charge $1,000 Canadian bond for the teacher to come to teach. And that was 1929. And then continually up to 1950s, when my husband Dean was the first group of postgrad study to UBC in uh, 1948, and then he also was a teacher. He also taught at the Chinese public school, Wakyu Ha Hao. He had to, my father-in-law had to pay $1,000 bond for his entry. And can you imagine how much that $1,000 is and how hardship it is? My uncles were all teachers and they all had to pay it. So for that reason, other than the head tax that you all hear about, the Chinese at the Hotel of Vancouver when Harper announced that they would pay $20,000 to each surviving uh, head tax uh, spouse or person. 90% of them thanked me, including an age 100 year old lady, Mrs. Fung, I never forget that, that I had helped, fought, that they were able, but it didn't stop there. I went in 1964, no, sorry, 1961. The restaurant in Chinatown at that time, like Sai Wu, Sai Wu Chan Gun, all those Chinese schools, the cooks were getting old. So they were getting old, there was no help uh, or no ear. So I went to Ellen, Ellen Faircroft, conservative minister of immigration. I asked her to help me legislate a program to allow the chef to come in for these retired restaurants. That's how the chef first in 1960 was passed in the federal government. Then in 1964, after I came back from Hong Kong, my first trip to Hong Kong, why? Because I started, I'm the founder of Canada Trust. Canada Trust, uh, not just Canada Trust itself, but the first time in Canada now I'm telling this you this is this is all history, and that's what Dixon wants me to tell you. So excuse me, I'm not bragging anything. I'm just telling the dates and time what happened. In 1962, September the 22nd, the first trust company of any trust company in Canada branch office, I opened and founder of the Canada Trust branch office in my Chinatown Oriental st style. Eight feet wide, 120 feet old building. No safe, but the trust of Dean Chun Kong Leong and myself, the client from Lower Mainland, all rushed to open their account with us. Why? We taught them how to earn daily interest. It was the first time of any trust company was able to receive deposit. All the deposit of daily interest, not quarterly, as all the big five bank was granting at that time. And we had so much deposit, and our daily deposit, <laughs> we don't have a safe, but we got Bank of Montreal next door. So we used their night deposit, and by taxi, it goes back to the branch office. And it was so successful that Guarantee Trust, Royal Trust, Montreal Trust, Commonwealth Trust, Yorkshire Trust came and learned from us and opened branch office all over town. And then China, Canada Trust opened Oak Ridge, follow me, and Oak Ridge and East Hastings. But I don't want to be bank manager, so that's where today the 
Canada Trust, which is now TD Canada Trust, at the corner of Maine and Kiefer are remaining. So I then, that was 1962, so Dean and I went to China. We went to Hong Kong, Hong Kong. We went to Hang San Bank, Wing Long Bank, Hang San Gan Hong, Wing Long Gan Hong. Correspondent Bank, first time in Hong Kong with the trust company between Canada and Ch Hong Kong. Why? Because I used to do a lot of transferring of funds for the Chinese uh, sending money back to the Orient for their families and for their Hong Kong uh, families, uh, education funds and so forth. So I felt that it was right for, at that time, was Hang San An Hong and Wing Lung An Hong was more able to do the correspondent bank. And that's how it started. At the same time, I planted the seat for HSBC to come to Canada because I was preparing for Bank of BC to open in my Mandarin building because I start to expand Chinatown. Chinatown commercial area. Expand it from Maine and Pender to Kiefer. I cleaned up the Kiefer 600 block second hand store and expand the Chinatown to Pyre, Kiefer, Georgia, Yuyan, Pyre, to be extension of Chinatown commercial area. And I built the Mandarin Center at the corner of Kiefer, which was at that time the first oriental large complex of six floors with the first two elevator, first underground parking, and a generator that served all of Chinatown and beyond to East Hastings. We opened on May the 24th, 1972, with 2,400 guests. And that was a big help because why? The restaurant always had small capacity. When there's a wedding or a banquet, it's always held at three different restaurants. So we had the top of the Mandarin of 10,000 square foot, the first 1,600 seating, and introduced the first dip sum push cart dip sum in the restaurant in Canada by bringing in 17 master chef, four dim sum specialty master chef, three gourmet master chef, barbecue chef, one ton chef, Western Bakery, which is the first time that you're enjoying today all those birthday cakes. It was the first time that Master Leong was baking egg tarts, birthdays, weddings cakes, and chestnut cake. Those were introduced in 1972 in my restaurant there that is, I'm very proud. Anyhow, I won't talk too long because this is all history. And Dixon is wanting to ask questions. So Dixon, come and, and help me out. What you want else to me to say? There's too much. If you want to listen more, another time, and you see my book coming out, and you can sponsor my book, and it'll tell you the stories of the Italian, the French, the East Indian, multi-culture, and how happy we are that today, all you wonderful salesperson, I wish you every success, every happiness in all your endeavor. God bless you all. We never come to an end yet. This is only intermission. Okay. Oh, intermission. You want to hear more? Well, you ask me a question, and I just want you to wish you the best because my heart is with you. Give back to the society what you can is my effort right now, and I really love you all. I thank you with all my heart how much I appreciate each and every one of you. You have a fan. I have a, a big fan. Oh! Okay. Oh, Tim! <laughs> oh, Tim! He's a chairman from the. Oh, Tim! <laughs> oh, you are a wonderful chairman. Uh, There's a special man for you. Oh, yeah. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, bless you. Oh, you yeah. very wonderful. We have we learned a lot of history from you. Well, you have all have to guide me. 
and you all have to lead me, and I will do what I can to teach every one of you. Oh, thank you. Oh, God bless you all. Thank you. Our factory. <laughs> uh, before we leave, there's uh, something that we want to talk about that. Right now, Chinatown has a big change. Yeah. You heard about that. Yeah. Not only Chinatown, they have a, a new development along the Kempi Corridor. Everything has been changed. That's why we hope everybody, if you have any question about real estate, ask her in the intermission. Okay? Chinatown. Not only Chinatown. Chinatown no more. It's gone. Uh, Canada is going to be gone. Canada, the government sold all our national resources to foreign owned. The Royal, the Hyatt building, the Royal building is going to own by the German. And the Chinese are going to own everything. It's yes. No, they haven't out. sold it because he's part of NASA at the old Hitler time. So they're fighting it. But you look at Chinatown, Toronto, Newfoundland. Vancouver, pretty soon Canada is going to be owned by foreigners. So you guys go out, sell Canada, sell Vancouver, sell Toronto. It's already owned half by the foreign investor. Go and sell them all. So they'll be, they'll make some money from it. Otherwise, somebody else is going to do it. Go Bento building or hotels, Bayshore is already sold. So go to it. Go and make your sale. All the best. You want to show, show everything. That's why we are Canadian Chinese. If you want to get more listing, ask Fayla. She has so many things that we want to sell, okay? <laughs> have a big crap, please. Okay, gonna... Thank you. We have a break about five to ten minutes. Let's have a drink. Toilet time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The best is yet to come. Everybody knows about our Premier Van der Sam. If you don't know, I will tell you about Premier Van der Sam and how you're going to protect your commission because Van der Sam is, was the Premier. I received in March a voice message directly from the Premier. And I said to, to my husband and son, why is the Premier himself calling me? Why is the, he's leaving a message for me to call his wife because I say Premier doesn't usually call himself. It's always by a secretary or a uh, assistant. So the second message came also from the Premier directly himself. Okay, so I returned the phone call, and he said that he wanted me to see his wife Lillian about his fantasy garden, his property in Chilliwack, in Surrey, the 57 acre, 74 acre that I'm telling Dixon to see if he can resell it now. But however, it turned out that instead of dealing with his wife, which he asked me to go and see, which I did. She lined it all up on their coffee table. They live at the Fantasy Garden on Number 4 Road on Steveden Highway in a little dinky apartment of 600 square foot at the end of the castle apartment. He said to me, he had a lot of realtor try to sell the Fantasy Garden before he called me. And that was Bob Lee, Jeff Louie, and so forth, so forth. It was difficult because he had so many lawsuits against him at the tenants of the Fantasy Garden. He was in default of three mortgages. I said to him, let's go and see what your finance situation is. Your first mortgage is with CIBC. CIBC is also the bank of the BC government. If the BC, if the government was not dealing with CIBC, the government, CIBC would have uh, for, uh, forced him into bankruptcy because he was so behind on his mortgage. So I said, okay, I'll draw a special business plan that is suitable to sell the fantasy garden, that is able to sell the fantasy garden. If I sell it for 16 million 
and I put 16 million in your pocket, and I ask the syndication of Taiwan Group, who I am very familiar with because I opened the Taiwan market in 1984. I stayed in Taiwan back and forth and coordinated with the friends over there, including uh, Choi Hung of the Fortune Hotel for the Taiwan Olympic. So in 1984, I stayed there. So when I went back there in 1990 for Vandersham, I says, okay, this business plan is feasible. The syndication fees, including the commission, is $2 million. The syndication of financing. I went to CIBC and I asked Vandersham to come with me, which he was scared to. He won't go. I went and saw CIBC Vice President, Mr. Polip. Mr. Polip, he is so behind. I'm going to do the syndication and this business plan and to sell this fantasy garden. I have several people from Taiwan and, uh, and uh, that I could put it together. I host in my home cocktail buffet for part of the group that came over from Taiwan. Gee, they used to tell me how much they can put cash in their briefcase. Did you know $87,000 US will fill one, br one briefcase <laughs> cash? <laughs> I can tell you all kinds of funny story, but it's too long and too interesting that I get a kick out of it myself. I laugh myself when it keeps flowing out of my mind. So ended up CIBC gave me letters of recommending me of this plan that I had prepared for the Premier Van der Sam in his dairy street. I got a letter from CIBC for Singapore, for Philippines, for Hong Kong, and for uh, Taiwan to finance if I needed to, which I didn't. So I, the business plan worked. I brought them over. Mr. Tan Yu, the billionaire, he was the richest private company in in, in China or Taiwan, Southeast Asia for that matter, because he's originally from Philippines. And he lived in Taiwan. And they own banks and hotels and uh, malls and so forth. And we were going to open a bank in, in Canada, a uh, affiliated bank of his Asia World Enterprise. So the premier surprised me well, after all, he's a premier. He's the head of British Columbia. Who am I to question that he is dealing with me directly, not his wife that is supposed to be? When he became the leader of the social credit in 1986 at Whistler, he declared all his asset is going into blank trust, which is important for all government officials. When they become a government official, all their asset goes into blind trust. And he announced that his blind trust was his wife, Lillian. And he was going to use his premiership to promote Fantasy Garden. So Fantasy Garden, he did. He had all the government function at Fantasy Garden because it was huge. It's 25 acre, beautiful gardens and observatory, banquets, and oh, just beautiful. It's actually a national treasure. It was so beautifully constructed. Unfortunately, he runs into financial difficulty that all his premier's pay, payment, goes to Fantasy Garden. So he was in a tough, tough time. When, when I came along, I worked with him directly, which I was shocked because that was only me, the premier, and the billionaire, three of us. My husband. When D Dean was very protective and loving, he was sometime accompanied by driving me to Fantasy Garden. Other than that, just that. So, when Tan Yu came and I carried, well, my husband carried in his briefcase the cash, and we, uh, we checked in at the Western Bay Shore. He gave me his cash or his envelopes to open a safety deposit box. Now this is the famous area that you all heard about and read about and want to know the real story because the Chinese never had put out the real story. The real story as it really happened. 
So then the Sam came up to the uh, hotel at the Bayshore, and in our suite, we were closing the Fantasy Garden deal. On the Fantasy Garden deal, there's a note for the syndication of $2 million for Taiwan Group, including the commission, 1.5. Fantasy Garden was $16 million. He asked me to change it to US dollar, because at that time, Maloney, the baloney? <laughs> Maloney was the prime minister. I was having the Meech Accord. And the Meech Accord, he had to fly into Ottawa regarding that, and that's going to be US dollar, the Canadian dollar is going to be going down pretty low. And I believe it went down to 35% against the US dollar. So $1 would only give us less $35. So. We changed that interim at the hotel. There was a dinner waiting for us at the Imperial restaurant. We couldn't go because we were f doing this, closing this deal. It was a long, hard deal to close. I said, this is the note that you sign for the syndications, fees, and the commission. When we close it, you have to pay it. But he says, okay, talk to Taiwan and see if we can do it less. I went to the telephone in the hotel, which is about 20 feet away from him. The note sat on the table. I always remember that. I called Taiwan while he's sitting there and all the rest were sitting in the, alongside, including his wife on the bed, because she couldn't be bothered. It was his job, which is certain it should have been hers. So when I came back and I said, okay, they can reduce it, the syndication cost. The $2 million note's gone. Hey, what happened to the $2 million box? Is it in your pocket? Not on the floor, not in the garbage. Dirty bugger. He took that note and hide it. Baby is in his pocket. I couldn't search his pocket. So. Taiwan says, well, then if he did that, let's keep it, let's get that everybody has to be paid. The commission had to be paid, the syndication fees for the financing has to be paid. So we ended up that I got him to sign for a million and a half. With 500,000 going to the syndication, a million to our share commission with our corporations and our sales. It was signed and sealed. Then he asked, Tan Yu, you have a brown envelope that you brought all that cash because Tan Yu was going to buy the Hilton Airport in Los Angeles. That's what the cash was for. So Tan Yu it says, Faye, go down to the safety deposit box and bring that brown envelope up. Because when I opened the box, I gave Tanya the key. He says, no, you, you carry it, because he trusted me and my husband immensely. I brought the brown envelope back to the hotel room. Tanya says to my husband, Leong, Dean Leong, count it. Dean counted the... US dollar in $1,000 stack on the coffee table at the hotel room 1980, underneath the floor where Howard Hugh lived, that famous. So between Howard Hugh and Tanya and me and Premier Vanessa made history for the Western Bayshore Inn Hotel that is everlasting. Dean counted it, $20,000 stack of $1,000 bill. Dean says, Bill, here it is. You count it. Tan Yu says, count it. Bill counted the stack of $1,000 stack, scoop it up, put it in his pocket. That is the real story that the whole city or the whole province in Hong Kong was talking about. The famous brown envelope of $20,000 the premier had pocket. But when he was questioned, 
by the opposition at that car at that time was led by Harcourt, Glenn Clark, and Sohoda. He says, "Oh, that money was for me to buy a jet and some furniture to send to Taiwan." His accountant by that time entered the picture. At that time, well, be four of us. His accountant. I believe it was Peak and Maverick at that time before the merge, the premier, billionaire Tan Yu, and myself. His closing of statement for the Fantasy Garden shows $20,000 went to his trip to California and went to him buying his clothes. So who's telling the real story? The worst of all, when it was closed, and it was supposed to be announced on September the 7th of 1990 in the International Suite at Bayshore, Western Bayshore Inn for the media to announce. He didn't dare to announce himself then because after all, he's a premier, he's supposed to be a national uh, uh, blind trust. So it was announced that the Fantasy Garden is sold. And we went down, it was supposed to be a luncheon for the media and ourselves. Went back to the hotel room, the deal collapsed. The deal collapses because two lawyers, Alexander Lyle and Bodin, they neglect to apply for the Canadian government approval for foreign investment over X number of dollars. Because you have to declare and get the approval from the national government for foreign ownership. So the deal collapsed in the hotel room. The lawyers will start walking out. And I says, come back. There is also a way. If it collapsed today, how could Vanessam carry on and all the interest and tenure and all that while you approve for Canada investment? Let's make a deal now. Possession today. All the incoming and outgoing expenses goes to the new owner and to be debit and credit upon approval of the national government foreign investment deal. In hard negotiation, I did close it that day to save the deal. So in the meantime, being announced that it's been sold, and the opposition start to ask what happened, why a month later it is not registered, ask the premier. The premier was very, very, what do you say, sarcastic or, or obnoxious. He says to the media, none of your business. So the media got cross at Van der Sam, and they went digging. They went digging why it was not registered by the end of September as it says it was, and it's still outstanding. All he had to say instead of none of your business was that because we needed the government for an approval. That became a political football, a political circus. They found out that Van der Sam never gave the blind trust as he has to do by law. He was in breach of contract, breach of public office, conflict of interest, because he was himself dealing on this deal. Opposition and the public start to outcry. We want a public inquiry. The public inquiry finally went on by Commissioner Hugh, Ted Hughes, who was the former Attorney General of Saskatchewan. We were all under oath. And when you see, when I have a chance to publish this book, my title is, you probably always heard of, it ain't over to the fat lady sing. And I'm not too far from fat, but, but my title will be, the hat lady sings. Premier Van der Sam, billionaire Tan Yu, Fantasy Garden. The, this thick of the document, that the government prosecutor had put together. Each page was side by side, back to back, handwritten letter between me and the premier. 
under oath at the Ted Hughes inquiry of the document. He cannot deny. He cannot sue anybody. It's false because it was our own handwriting the whole year, every day, back to back. When I was in Taiwan, how it is, what it is. Van der Sam used the government office. His picture signed Premier of British Columbia. The government gives the government Premier pin, the government information as a gimmick to sell Fantasy Garden. But he made me pay for admission to the Fantasy Garden when I brought Mike Mercado to do the video of the sale and to buy the flower, flowerful placemat and all those various prop, uh, promotions or sale at the gift shop to take to Taiwan. Honestly, I can't believe it. However, out of all that, the Hughes inquiry found that he was he uh, conflict of interest. So the core conflict of interest, breach of public office, breach of trust. Ten minutes after the Ted Hughes inquiry came out, Van der Sam immediately, the first premier in the Commonwealth, in disgrace resigned. And the court charged him for the conflict of interest and breach of trust and breach of government office. At the trial, the outcome, the head, Mr. Cam, uh, Honorable, Mr. M Honorable Mr. Justice Campbell wrote in his, in his de uh, declarations of Vandersam is conflict of interest, stupid of breach of public office, breach of trust, but not guilty. So he got a slap on the wrist. And that came out on the front page of the magazine, McLean Magazine. My husband told me to frame it because any little petty shoplifter would have been sent to jail or fine, but not Premier Van der Sam, because Premier boasts that I, Premier of British Columbia, are the boss of all those judges, all those lawyers, also David Lamb, the Lieutenant Governor. He made David Lamb, then the Lieutenant Governor, to host a luncheon in the government house in Victoria for Tanyu and our entourage and me so that impress Tanyu of his government authority. When I arrive at the government house, David Lamb is an old friend of mine. He and his wife never cease to thank Dean and I for getting him into real estate getting into his house on Ash Street by Camby and getting his kids at the Sir Winston Churchill School until they pass away. I says, David, here I am at the government house in Victoria. You're hosting the luncheon for the Premier of British Columbia and the billionaire and myself. What am I supposed to address you now? Your, your Excellency, your honor, because you're a Lieutenant Governor. He says, Faye, come on, you just call me Hey, you! <laughs> so ever since then, he says, just call me, hey, you! <laughs> so that's the lieutenant government good friend. And at that luncheon, Tanyu was busy writing out the report of Fantasy Garden, sent it back to Taiwan, to Hong Kong, to his public company, to increase his stock to go sky high, because he just brought the Fantasy Garden in Richmond, in Greater Vancouver, Richmond, but from the Premier of Vandersam. So, the story is so enormously, then it comes to my commission. Where is it? I go, I, it's, it's supposed to be in the trust account of the lawyer of Alexander Lang. Bodine was the lawyer. Premier Vandersam says, I'm the Premier, I'm the boss. I license you lawyer. So, I have a right to take that commission out of your trust account, give it to me the whole in trust. He took the commission as his trustee 
in trust, which is negligent and unprofessional for the lawyer office. And he had, Premier Van Dessen had no right to do that. You all in real estate knows this is wrong. Unprofessional and wrongdoing. But they did. So to this day, if you go and collect that $1 million, I'll donate the 90% to wherever you want, and you can keep the 10%, because he still owe it. And under the trust agreement, under in trust, there's no time limit. So Van Sam pocket that $1 million commission, because he was the premier, and Alexander Lang lawyers was negligent, unprofessional, has given it to the premier when it should go to us for distribution. That's how, what you call, politically maneuver. Or what you call, the big guy says to you little guys, you, I can do what I want, and the itch with you. So you got to remember, when you're deep, I have it all signed. I was just gonna say, you remember, do you get everything all signed? I have everything all signed and sealed. I have his signature. One particular letter, I was very always laugh. He wrote it out, and then he says in the closing, Lillian sends your, uh, Lillian sends your love. I'll show it to you. And sign Lillian, when you know darn well he wrote it. So <laughs> how could you say Lillian sends your love when you're writing it, and sign Vanderson? Simply because he was trying to avoid that he was dealing it directly himself, but he did. So it went on to all kinds of a crazy circus that the Chinese newspaper never ever have given the right information. It's always manufactured information and fabricated information. This is why the, the public has been demanding me for my book. Why did the premier of Van Der Sam have private chat with Fei Leong on Fantasy Garden? And that, and I was so respectful, as I always am, on, on the um, office of the official. That's why I always have good friends in the government, because I'm respectful of their office and their position and their person. I did not say, without being asked a question, I did not talk about why, what, and how, unless the Ted Hughes inquiry asked me or the lawyer asked me. That's why I never did vouch that he's really in conflict of interest. He wrote letters to Philippines, he wrote letters to Irvine, California about Tan Yu and his deal to do this and this and giving instructions. He wrote all kinds of things that was conflict of interest and breach of office. I saved his face because of being respectful, which I shouldn't have. Because after all, why should I? But I did, out of respect. So today, I'm out of, I did not get one cent, but the worst of it all was that I paid $78,125 US dollar back in 1990 when the US dollar was 30 cents to a dollar, of US dollar. I, lo I lent that to him. He said to me, he, he said to my husband, Dean and I, my grandchildren, my son and daughter, my wife and I will be forever grateful if you go with Fei to Taiwan because you know the Kunis there. You go with Fei and close the deal. I'm forever grateful. And when you lend me this money, which he needed so badly, he never paid us a cent at all to this day, that my husband said, this is our reserve emergency fund. This is Faye emergency fund, my funeral fund, and my son's tuition fund. The moment Faye put $16 million in your pocket, you pay it back, which we did. Sign and seal by Van Sam, hereby agree. No, he ate that up. We did not have a penny back from what we lent him. So that's a big lesson for you to remember. When you're dealing with some people, you have to take the caution, even you trust them in their position, in their deal, how it can end up to where I am today. 
So this is why I'm still working long hours for my own fighting because Fanu Sam eaten me up. And he created and fabricated all the stories thereafter, which is too long. It's larger than the bowl of material to tell you. But give, that gives you the just of really how it happened. So there's no commission, no expense paid. I paid all the expenses, all the airfare, all the difficulty, because I was too darn good-hearted and trustworthy. My doctor says this is now 2016. You better not trust everybody, which I do. So you realtor there, when you're selling, whether it's a $16 million commission uh, project, no, sorry, $1 million commission for a $16 million project, or a $100 project, watch who you're dealing with. Listen, even sign and seal with witnesses. It can go into a terrible situation as it happened to me. And it's there. I have all, whatever I say today or any time, I have the proof, I have the material, I have the photographs, I have the letters. It's so important that these are preserved for posterity because it's part and parcel of the Canadian, of the city, of the province heritage. To let, to keep it as an inspiration for the next generation knowledge for the public knowledge of the immigrations, masses of immigration. At first, as I was talking about immigration, I talked about in 1964, I have, when I came back from Hong Kong, which I represent Hang San Bank here in Canada until 1970. I went with Jack Nicholson, then Minister of Immigration, which was Lieutenant Governor thereafter, to legislate a business investment program on business people. In other words, prior to 1964, the immigration policy is only relative, blood relations of the Chinese here, pioneer, with children under 18, fought to age 19, then to 25 before they can apply to come to Canada with their wives because the Chinese were not allowed to bring their family since 1923. So, I, after I did the Hang San Bank and Hong Kong Bank correspondent with Canada Trust, I found out that they are those that want to come in business class. Skill, professional, were not allowed. And that's when I went to work. Just patriotically for the Chinese and for the community. Nothing to do with me. I wasn't bringing anybody here. So we worked on it and we got the white paper proof and legislated the business and skill and labor program in 1967. And that's when Hong Kong people witnessed the China Liberation Army walked in and marched in in China. So that frightened the Hong Kong people. Then that's why they all start application to come to Canada. And that was 1967. 66, 67. So the first batch of billionaires and business people from Hong Kong arrived. My home was Grand Central Station. Like, for example, R.C. Yong, Chia Bing Wing, Shaw family, doctors, Yu Guok Ding, like David Lam, Lam Su Chai, Ho Tim, all those. I can show you the pictures. My family then was three of us for dinner, but I'm always cooking and nursemaid and drivers and chauffeur for 14 people for dinner every day and host a whole bunch of banquets just of good heart as a realtor. And it, now then, I'll give you one story that you gotta watch. Just because you're good to them, that doesn't mean that they're gonna give you back five cents for coffee. I showed them a piece of duplex on the corner, one of them, that's the Shaw family. That's Robert Shaw. He now fitting around in nightclub here. On the corner of 49th and Canby, that duplex on the corner. It was snowstorm. And Robert knocked on my door a year before on Thanksgiving. Says he was staying at the Y covering his eyes to take a shower because it was such a broken and he only had apple pie for the weekend. Well, I bring him in because his parents is coming. Okay, for the weekend. 
He stayed a whole year, and I have to rush home every day from my business and my entertainment, cook for him a steak and corn every day before I go to my activity. And he enrolled with my son's school at Winston Churchill. His grandfather, Run Run Shaw's brother, sends a $10,000 a month for him to pay for his school fee. So what he does, he go to Winston Churchill, he apply for a 16 year old uh, milk credit and bought his own car with the money and live free room and board in my house. So when the parents did arrive, I show him the duplex at 49th and Camby. That is close to Winston Churchill. So what did they do? They circumvent me. They went to another, this is, oh, I can, I can buy both of them by another guy. Well, I said, that's a duplex, it's supposed to be two housing. So you see, you have to watch these guys. They're crooks, they're canny. Well, that's another story another time. <laughs> but however, being in sales, you are being circumvent all the time. The latest for your information that I'm circumvented with my good friend, uh, uh, pe petroleum engineer Gary Vanderdrift and Mrs. Ng. I, in 2008 and 2006, I worked toward with CNOC and C Sinopec and CNPC, China National Petro Corporation, the largest three company of China in oil and gas. So CNOC uh, that bought Alberta Nexum, N-E-X-U-M, which you read about now, for $15 billion. He signed and sealed, and I have the pictures and the documents signed and sealed in my hotel room at the Great Wall of China in Beijing. 15 billion with 140 million of commission belonging to their groups of corrupted official. In, uh, in 2008, we signed and sealed it, and we bought the Nexus, Nexus DTO to China. It was bought and approved by the government of Canada a year and a half ago. So China, CNOC, China National Overseas, uh, or Dwelling Corporation owns it now and circumvented us that my friend is trying to declare to the government of the corrupted officers. I have no hope of receiving it. But I'm telling you this because you're in sale, you have to be cautious, you have to be careful what you're doing, who you're dealing with, even you trust them and you believe in them patriotically or friendly or respectful. So, stories of that happened, and I would skip the immigration about doing with Nicholson on 64 that the business people can come. Then on 1966, I got the caregiver, the nanny approved, because they all have servants and they couldn't bring them when those business people came. And the nurses. It's all on record, I've done that in, with Nicholson. Then, in 1980, 79, Lloyd Axworthy, I said to him, how about the entrepreneur program, the enterprise program, to let these people come, besides skilled professional and business people and no but relation, but also of able to be here to be in business entrepreneur, enterprises, and investment, immigration investment program. That was 1979. Lloyd Exworthy was the Minister of Immigration at that time. And he said he need to sell the 10 provinces in Canada before they can legislate these program. He used my paper, my application, my report to sell to 10 provinces so that this program can be legislated. That is how it started and that's how today there is masses of immigrant, masses of billions of dollars here. I work with them on it only patriotically for you folks, for the people, for the immigrant. I don't know. We sacrifice our time 
our family time to do it, but we've done it, and I'm proud that so many immigrants are here today under those programs and immigrant consultants are approving it. So now you have caregiver, you have nannies, you have business people, skill, professionals, entrepreneur, immigration investment program, all that has been legislated. And I did that from 1964 to 1980 with one, two, three, four limit immigration officers. So that is in a nutshell, a little bit of a story of what happened here as it happened. The life and times, the heart and soul that woven the gold fabric inlaid with black thread as it happened here. And that's all I can tell you now because I've used a lot of your time already and I thank you all for being so patient and hear me yicky yaki yaki all the time and the premier. So if you go and collect the premier's money, you take it, it's all for you because I doubt it, I can take it, but I do have the papers. I do have his signed agreement. So thank you one and all for your kindness, and thank you so much to hear me tell a little bit of life as it was, and especially thank you to Dixon Tang for your greatness and your wonderful leadership, to leader of the leader to make stories happen, be told for the generation, and leave it for the next generation to know what life is about to us local pioneer at that time. Then I want to thank Elvin C, who did this beautiful video, and a very wonderful webcaster and videographer, and a good friend that did my website for free, Andrew Fong, I call him the doctor of mechanic, and John Barbarian, Gary Lee, Juliet Ho, Michael Chang, uh, uh, Danny, da Danny, and uh, 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 Hong, H HSBC banker. I have to, sh Kenneth Kong, I have to show you the seat I paid. Did you know that your bank went and came to uh, Canada to buy the Bank of VC through Bahama to save $200 million tax? <laughs> also, thanks to Katie. Katie, Katie, Katie um, Danny, Michael, Yvonne, everybody, each and every one. Thanks a lot with all my heart. <laughs> Heartfelt appreciation. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. 好多謝各位來臨,這是這票真的講得很清楚。很精彩。亂七八糟不好意思啊。亂七八糟是我們的榮譽,就是他的故事實在感人。做一個地產經濟最重要的一句話,有良心。有良心。有良心的永遠就走得遠,不怕的。We are wilter, we work in hard, right? No matter how, how hard we have to struggle by, us, uh, by ourselves, I wish everybody Happy New Year and Prosperity Year to come. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Don't let it get down. Whenever you're down, stay up. I won't get down. Look no, at me. <laughs> you never get down. You're the leader. Hey, Andrew. Okay, thank you.